Hi there, I'm Nafisa Latic and this is Across the Balkans. On the show today, we go to Croatia, where tourism is bursting back to life after more than a year of COVID-19 lockdowns. Croatia has become one of the first European countries to lift most of its restrictions for foreign visitors. Travelers just need a vaccination certificate and a negative test result. Tourism Minister Nikolina Brnjac says the country is still maintaining precautions, but new infections are down to double digits and a quarter of the population has been fully vaccinated. The most prized destination is the city of Dubrovnik. I'll speak to the mayor in just a moment, but first Mirna Brekalo is there to see how the city is gearing up for the season. The Pearl of the Adriatic, Croatia's tourism hotspot. The city of Dubrovnik, with its red and orange rooftops stretching from the Asian city walls, attracted a record-breaking 1.5 million tourists in 2019, the year before the pandemic took hold. Now it's clear by the numbers entering the city gates that tourism here is not as it once was. This is the city's main street. It used to be uncomfortably packed with tourists walking shoulder to shoulder down the 300 meter long promenade. Now, even at the end of June, the walk is much more pleasant and enjoyable and it's easier to see all the city sites. In the narrow and mysterious lanes are the locals who are here to stay. For them, the lack of tourists has felt like a curse. But there's optimism here too that the good times could be just around the next corner. To me mati prisilno naučila radi kad sam bila dijete. <laughs> I onda sam se negdje poslije rata iz nekakve nostalgije i želje da se produži ta tradicija odlučila baviti baš konavonskim vezom. Dakle, radim ga sama uz pomoć cijele familije, naravno. I 2012. smo otvorili ovu butigu na ovome mjestu. I išlo nam je dobro. Išlo nam je dobro, naravno dok nas korona nije sve srezala, ali to je viša sila. Evo koliko je zapravo danas ljudi ušlo u vaš... A, danas nismo zaradili još ni jednu kunu, ali mi smo optimistični. E, bilo je posjetitelja. Za razliku od drugih dana, kad dogodi se da vam niko ne uđe u butigu cijeli dan. Danas je bilo desetak mušterija, zainteresirano su gledali, raspitivali se, vratit će se, neće se vratiti, nije važno, ali je važno da neko uđe. Jako je ružan osjećaj kad vam niko ne uđe u butigu cijeli dan. Dubrovnik and the entire county relies heavily on tourism. During the coronavirus crisis, the business of individual companies has declined by almost 90%. Ivan, who shows tourist location from the HBO series Game of Thrones, was left mainly sitting at home. Prošla sezona je bila završena, ali za od, za odmorit. Sve ostalo je bilo katastrofa, katastrofalno jer su bile restrikcije u ovoj travel industriji, tako da je bilo nešto malo jahtaša, malo ovih nekih hrabrih koji su se ono borili sa covidom, ali Dubrovnik je bio potpuno prazan. There's hope that things are about to turn around. Croatia has opened up to all foreign tourists as long as they hold a vaccination certificate or have a negative covid test. So we had the trip originally planned uh, in the fall of 2020, which obviously didn't happen because of coronavirus. Um, and so as soon as we knew we were vaccinated and uh, that things were opening back up and we would be able to travel um, to Europe and to Croatia, we rescheduled the trip and here we are. It was actually pretty easy because we were fully vaccinated uh, from the US and so we were able to fly 
Uh, we flew through Amsterdam and then we were able to fly into uh, Split, actually in Croatia, um, without any testing or anything necessary. To make guests feel safe and to make up for the losses, workers in Dubrovnik's tourism industry recorded the highest number of people vaccinated in the country. Large hotels have also had to adapt their facilities and offers in order to attract guests. So can you please tell me how did you prepare for this uh, 2021 season uh, in Dubrovnik? We've been preparing, uh, you know, all this season with the staff trainings, staff hirings, and uh, new entertainment programs, new uh, way of uh, understanding the new way of, of the, our guests. Because they want more health here, they want more space, more privacy. And we understand all these uh, new requests and we prepare ourselves accordingly. So we renovated the hotel, almost everything and is more fresh colors, more spaces. Having a more meaningful experience here is a part of a long-term strategy to build up a sustainable tourism model that prioritizes quality over quantity. And that has only been made possible by the pandemic. COVID-19 brought immense losses, but also an opportunity to totally reset the town's tourism. Dubrovnik je najljepši kad u njemu ima malo ljudi, jer ga onda možete vidjeti cijelo ga i doživjeti. Ono što smo imali ranijih godina, to mislim da nije bilo dobro ni Dubrovniku, ni posjetiteljima Dubrovnika. Jednostavno, over turizam ne služi nikome, ima kontraefekte. Meni je iskreno bilo žao tih ljudi koji su došli iz bijeloga svijeta vidjeti Dubrovnik pa se onda ugušili u gužbi. Pa sve na Balkanu traje malo duže. Znači, ono, sve krize koje su bile nama je trebalo jedno pet godina da se oporavimo. Ali ja mislim da smo se mi već oporavili, da će sljedeća godina biti ono što smo rekli prihvatljiva i održiva i da bi to trebalo nekako držati. Jer je ovo uvijek bio grad sa mjerom, a taj grad je stvarno izgubio mjeru i 2018. i 19. i 17. I stvarno ljudima koji su imali novac i koji su htjeli doći u Dubrovnik, rekli su da je bilo užasno iskustvo doći ovdje u onom srcu ljeta. Da je ono, nemaju uopće, nisu nikakvu emociju pokupili. Almost a quarter of Croatian's economy comes from tourism and Dubrovnik is the nation's most proud destination. If the city is able to rebound from the pandemic to a more sustainable level of tourism, the future could look even brighter. Mirna Brekalo, TRT World, Dubrovnik, Croatia. My guest today is the mayor of Dubrovnik, Mato Frankovic. Uh, Mato, thanks so much for coming in on Across the Balkans. Good to have you on the show. Um, are you confident that it's safe to come and visit your city at the moment? Absolutely. Uh, more than 90% of uh, tourist workers are already vaccinated with uh, two shots. 53% uh, of uh, Dubrovnik population is already vaccinated. We are continuing with the vaccination uh, every week and uh, considering the number of COVID positive cases, currently we have just three persons that are COVID positive in Dubrovnik. Uh, so Dubrovnik is a really safe uh, destination and we want to keep that safety, uh, of course, uh, through the vaccination of uh, local population, but also keeping a social distance as uh, much as we can uh, in hoping to get more and more tourists, uh, like things are really go going to uh, are going in good direction in Dubrovnik. Right. right. Uh, there are fears uh, with the new variants emerging uh, now again, uh, and critics say it's too early to fully reopen. What would you say to them? 
it's always there are always going to be a new variations. So now it's a Delta. Uh, a few months ago, it was a, a British sort of coronavirus. Next, maybe month or two, we will have new sorts. Uh, so what we have to do is, of course, uh, be vaccinated as number one keep distance as number second, and things will be okay. I'm absolutely confident that uh, uh, with uh, this uh, being responsible, uh, we can keep things under control and we can continue in recovering with tourist operations. I'm uh, very, very happy that uh, after uh, now more than one year, Turkish Airlines uh, is uh, going to continue and uh, they restart uh, their operations uh, to Dubrovnik Airport uh, this week. Right. And how exactly do you plan to control who is coming in, especially now when the city started to welcome uh, massive cruise ships as of recently? We have uh, already implemented uh, the COVID uh, applications uh, where we see who is actually uh, positive, uh, actually who has uh, overcome through the coronavirus uh, with the certificate uh, or who has the double shots uh, considering uh, vaccination. We are controlling everything. The cruise ships are uh, operating in special bubbles. They are not mixing with populations, still not. Uh, in following uh, upcoming days until we check everything is going uh, smoothly. Uh, considering uh, the parties, weddings, and etc., everything is uh, under strict control. Uh, all of those uh, that are coming to Croatia uh, need to have vaccination card or PCR test, and that is controlled at the airports. Uh, considering uh, parties, special occasions, and similar things with uh, where the, there are more than 30 people, uh, we have a special service which is controlling uh, all of those people that are there. So right. we really do not see problem currently and uh, we really keep things under control. Right. Uh, the EU's handling of the pandemic was criticized and now we are emerging from the crisis. Uh, the, the city has been badly hit economically too. How much help did the EU offer to the cities like yours? A lot. Through the government of Croatia, we really uh, received major help, mainly to the uh, local uh, entrepreneurs, restaurants, coffee bars, uh, different souvenir makers, and etc. Without help of uh, Croatian government and the EU, they could not survive these last 15 months. And as well, they helped the city of Dubrovnik uh, with giving us uh, actually uh, the money uh, loans uh, for the next three years in order uh, to get overcome uh, through this uh, crisis. Uh, we really uh, lost 50% uh, of uh, our uh, yearly budget in the corona uh, crisis time. So uh, we are slightly going through this, as I said previously, and right. I'm absolutely confident if we are opening slowly, step by step, if we are doing things carefully, that things will be uh, very, very good and that actually this season, we cannot count it and measure it with 2019. Uh, we need to do a lot more, uh, a lot less uh, than that in order to keep things uh, safe and to keep people that arrive in Dubrovnik uh, COVID uh, safe. Right. Before the pandemic, Dubrovnik was visited by millions of tourists. Many complained it was overcrowded. Me, myself, witnessed those massive crowds. Is this a chance to reset tourism in Dubrovnik and take a different approach and offer maybe better experience of the city itself? Absolutely. Quality over quantity. The quality is crucial. And Winston Churchill says once that every crisis is opportunity for new start. This is opportunity for new Dubrovnik sustainable tourism. And we will take this opportunity. We will uh, use uh, all the learnings and uh, things what we have from our recent past. And we will continue in the future definitely with sustainable tourism. So less tourists bigger quality, and this is, I think, the key of 
to success of one sustainable Dubrovnik. And uh, at the end, uh, Mr. Mayor, what's your message to those who plan to visit your city, especially from here, from this region and Turkey? Dubrovnik was never as beautiful such as now. You can enjoy, you can freely walk through the city streets. You are safe, of course, uh, but really, it was never, ever beautiful as it is now. Okay, Mato Frankovic, thanks so much for your time for us. Mayor of Dubrovnik, there for us on Across the Balkans. Thanks again for your time. It's a region with a long history of war and conflict. And it's argued that integration into the European Union and NATO would be beneficial for bringing stability. But for decades, the Western Balkans have only been partially integrated into Western security and economic structures. Last month, the leaders from Croatia and Slovenia, both EU members, and the six Western Balkan countries not a part of the EU, called on Brussels to speed up the enlargement process. So what's behind the delay? Axel Zajmovic explains. It's a community of 27 countries united behind the idea of working together for peace and prosperity. The European Union is governed by four principles, free movement of people, goods, capital and services. And it always kept the door open for other nations to join. The process of enlargement has taken place in several stages, from its founding with just 12 members in 1992. At that time, war-torn Yugoslavia was on the verge of breaking up. Within five years, the EU had adopted a roadmap for promoting peace in the former Yugoslav republics, which were struggling with their transition from the fall of communism. Europe is about to leave behind a century of war and destruction, but also one of hope and great opportunities. Europe as a region has been brought more and more closely together through political and economic integration. The Stability Pact for Southeastern Europe should become a turning point. A few years later, the EU laid out its succession plan for the entire Western Balkans to join the bloc. Enlargement is our most important tool to deliver peace and prosperity across our continent. This summit sends out the message that we want to get to our house in order to do just that. But fast forward two decades, and the status quo remains unchanged. All Western Balkan nations have applied for a membership. Only Croatia and Slovenia have been admitted. Meaning Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, and Serbia are still out in the cold. They're all somewhere in the process, but the road to EU membership is a long one. First, a country has to submit an application for membership to the Council, which then asks the European Commission for its opinion. The Commission then assesses whether the country is able to meet the conditions required to join, known as the Copenhagen Criteria. These include, for example, a state having stable institutions and guaranteeing democracy and the rule of law. Another requirement is a functioning and competitive market economy. But that's not all. Countries need to make a commitment to work towards meeting all the EU standards during the process of joining, based on the Commission's opinion on the application. All EU countries must unanimously decide if the country can receive candidate status and if and when accession negotiations can start. So, where do things stand with the Western Balkans now? Albania and North Macedonia had been expected to get approval for the formal accession process to begin in 2019. North Macedonia even changed its name following disputes with Greece in favor of EU negotiations. Despite the Commission's recommendations, Albania and North Macedonia were told they'd have to wait. Accession talks were blocked by France, Denmark and the Netherlands, seemingly due to domestic political pressure and anti-immigrant sentiment. It prompted a wave of criticism inside the bloc. C'est une lourde erreur historique, une lourde erreur historique. Et j'espère qu'elle aura été momentanée pour qu'elle ne s'inscrise pas dans, les, dans, dans, les, dans la mémoire collective comme étant restée une erreur historique. 
France is also reluctant about Bosnia and Herzegovina, calling it a ticking time bomb and a great threat due to what President Macron said was the country's problem with Muslim extremists. His remarks were widely condemned. Serbia is expecting to be next in line to start accession talks, but it's caught between two spheres of influence, whether to pursue greater European integration or look eastward to Russia. For now, the integration of the Western Balkans into the EU remains a bleak prospect, with political upheavals, struggling economies, and corruption that seems near impossible to root out. But it hasn't stopped the EU from reasserting its commitment to the region. The region has a special role in Europe and for Europe. We agreed that the Western Balkans is a region of key strategic, geostrategic role for the European Union. Our commitment to the Western Balkans need to be very visible and we should leave no doubt in this respect. However, the EU's continuous roadblocks and delays in the enlargement process could very well push the region in another direction entirely to start considering alliances with other nearby powers like Russia, Turkey and China, who will be more than happy for closer cooperation. Axel Zaimovic, TRT World. Joining me now is Hamza Karcic. He is an associate professor of international relations at the University of Sarajevo. Hamza, thanks so much for joining us here on Across the Balkans. Good to have you on the show. Now, uh, is there a shift uh, in EU policy towards the Western Balkans? Are we seeing that at the moment? I think the process of EU enlargement of the Western Balkans has been uh, on, on the back burner for some time. So I think, you know, the, some 10 years ago, we had this sense of perspective of joining the EU uh, in the near future. Now this has been put on hold. And I think uh, this, uh, the, the objective of joining uh, EU has become a distant ideal or a distant foreign policy goal for most uh, Balkan countries. So is there a risk that other countries uh, will fill the void? Uh, I think we have seen that over the last 10 to 15 years, with the American diplomatic drawdown, uh, there has been a power vacuum in the Balkans. And this power vacuum has been uh, filled, or, or we have seen a number of other actors, rising powers that have uh, become far more present in the region than was the case a decade ago. And especially this is the case with uh, Russia and China. So I think this combination of American uh, diplomatic drawdown and the receding sense of European Union membership uh, has opened the space for other great powers to be far more present in the region. You know, Hamza, China and Russia stepped in during the pandemic um, because the EU's response was woeful during the, the pandemic. Is there a danger that the vaccine diplomacy has further damaged the relations between the EU and the Western Balkans? I think that's true because among the first victims of the uh, outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic was the Schengen Agreement. And what the European Union response to the pandemic showed is a basic tenet of international politics, namely that states have to uh, take care of themselves. So the European Union's response was truly woeful. Uh, and I think that's when uh, Russia and China stepped in on a bilateral basis to assist uh, Central and Eastern European countries in getting the vaccines. So I think this combination of European Union's uh, inefficient response to the crisis and the make, and this increasing inroads by Russia and, and China uh, has become a new trend uh, that we have witnessed over the last over the last year and a half. Right. Um, does the general population in the Western Balkans um, even want to j join uh, the EU? And what benefits will they get? I think the, more, the public opinion polls show that the majority of the populations. Uh, in the remaining countries that haven't joined the EU are still supportive of the process. But, um, you know, it's not only a matter of whether the populations and nations want to join and states want to join the EU. It's also a matter of uh, these states adopting the pro-EU reforms, but also it's a matter of whether the EU enlargement fatigue uh, will figure as a factor that slows down the process. Then you have to take into account 
all the various vetoes that countries are faced with. I'm talking about the French veto of the opening of accession talks with uh, North Macedonia and Albania in 2019. And then we have the rising Islamophobia. We have the uh, increasing uh, tendency of Central European countries to turn into uh, towards illiberal uh, democracies. And then we have also uh, this sense that, or the factor that uh, some of the remaining countries of the Balkans that have yet to join the EU have significant uh, Muslim populations. And we have to see how Islamophobia figures as a factor that shapes the decision of European governments on EU's enlargement in the future. Right. I do want to bring in uh, NATO too now and the Western Balkans, another very important strategic interest for most of the countries. What do you think uh, at this moment it's more important for the Western Balkans, uh, its EU or its NATO path? I think NATO membership is by far the more important objective of uh, Balkan countries. And we have to, to just note that um, only Bosnia, Kosovo and Serbia have yet to join NATO. Uh, so, uh, for, for NATO, it makes strategic sense to finalize the process of enlargement to include this part or this corner of Europe. Uh, it would also be significant for NATO because uh, the US and NATO have, have invested significantly in the stability and security of Bosnia and Kosovo. So, the way of anchoring this uh, investment or the way of securing this investment in the long term would be for NATO to actually enlarge to include these two countries that NATO and the US have invested so much in uh, since the 1990s. Yeah, the declaration of the NATO summit in June said that the Western Balkans is of strategic importance as demonstrated by the long uh, history of cooperation and operations in the region. Uh, is this likely to translate uh, into action? Uh, we have yet to see that, but I think the Biden administration is uniquely positioned uh, to fast track Bosnia's and Kosovo's NATO accession process because these are relatively two relatively small countries and their inclusion into NATO would be quite uh, cost effective and so it would make strategic sense to finalize this process as you know as we all know uh, NATO essentially controls the Adriatic Sea except for this uh, small plot of land small corridor that, that is Bosnia's access to the sea so it would make strategic sense for NATO to enlarge. It would also be a fitting legacy for President Biden, who uh, in the 1990s championed Bosniak Muslims and Kosovo Albanians. So uh, at 78, he must be thinking of his legacy. And I think one of the best ways to ensure his legacy would be to actually uh, bring lasting peace to this corner of Europe. Okay, Hamza, unfortunately, I have to leave it there because of time. But I do appreciate your insights for us here on Across the Balkans. Hamza Karcic there, he's an associate professor of international relations at the University of Sarajevo. Thanks for watching this episode of Across the Balkans, the show dedicated to the people, places and stories of southeastern Europe. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye for now.